Lord, we love you. We love you, we love you, we love you. We thank you for this time. <clears throat> thank you for your presence here. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come be our teacher. Teach us the word. Impart to us the love that the Father has for the Son and the Son has for the Father. You invite us into that love. Put it inside of us, Lord God. We cannot do this without you. So we just um, set aside this time to hear your voice, to hear your word, and to latch onto it, to open the door of our heart to it, have it be placed in there to grow. We just thank you for this privilege to be together as your children to hear from you. We just thank you for that. We love you. We set our eyes upon you. We just bless this time now. In Jesus' name, amen. So 12 years ago was the first time I ever heard teaching on Song of Solomon. I told you all about um, that I went to the One Thing Conference in 2010, and that was when the Lord really put his finger on my heart uh, to press into the intimacy message. It was something that I definitely did not have um, a grasp on. My eyes were really open to the impact of it, and the Lord just had me focus on it for an extended period. And so um, I dove into, I got back to Colorado, where I was living at the time, dove into the intimacy message, looked up um, teachings um, on intimacy with Jesus, on Mary of Bethany, love that, on John the Disciple, the Beloved, and just really um, started to go down that journey of growing in the truth of the Word of God. Not a theme. It's the truth of the Word of God. His heart is after yours. That's the truth. And I needed that. And so I dove in, and, and one of them was Song of Solomon. And I started studying Song of Solomon, and I was hooked. And 12 years later, I'm not just teaching it. I still study it regularly. I still go through it regularly. And I'll, I'll show you guys just practically some of the ways I do it. Um, but the main thing is not so much Song of Solomon. The main thing is him, Amen. right? Growing in intimacy with him. Song of Solomon is just a really fun way to do it. In my life, it's touched me deeply. But there's all different ways to do it, and our goal is him, always him. Um, so some of, the, some of the things I did do, I'll just share with you all. Um, I'm a journaler. If you are not, it's okay. You don't have to feel bad about it. We all connect with the Lord in different ways. Some people just write a few things down. Some people don't write anything down. I write a lot down. And it's just something that I do. And so when I started to dive into the Song of Song message, um, I had come out here, oh, I don't know, I was probably a year and a half into just really um, learning the message of Song of Solomon. And I came out here, Christina was at IHOPU, and um, I went to her Song of Solomon class. And it must have been at the very beginning because they gave them this assignment. They said, take a notebook and write out the verse. 
and then journal on that verse. And then put down cross-references. That's one thing that's super unique about Song of Solomon, since it is an allegorical writing, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's symbolic. The whole book is. This isn't just Jesus giving a parable. The whole book is symbolic. So because of that, it's unique. And what we want to do is make sure when we're studying it, we're not adding our theology to it. It contains the theology of the Bible. And so I would write down lots of cross-reference verses that backed up the symbolism. Super helpful to get your mind on what it is that you're seeing and studying. So this is what I did. I would just write down the verse, and then I would um, write down the meaning. Okay? And then the purple is when I did it again. And the red is when I did it again. What I'm talking about is over years and years and years, I went through this book over and over and over. Um, one of the things I'm doing right now is I bought a just a little um, Song of Solomon from Amazon. I heard that they might carry these in our bookstore. And it's just a Song of Solomon with empty space. Okay, so this is what I'm doing right now, and I'm about halfway through it again. And while I'm doing that, I'm using um, the Passion Translation. Is The footnotes on the Passion Translation are amazing for Song of Solomon. Um, so I've used that in the past. This is also a little book called The Divine Romance, and it's written by the authors of the Passion Translation. This is what I'm using right now. It's just little devotionals on every verse. And I'm using that with my journaling. And so I, I also have a, a couple different ones from different prayer rooms that people have given me. And I go through those. So I just, for 12 years now, I'm not talking about every day. I'm talking about at least weekly couple times a week, maybe every day for a couple weeks, just whatever I feel like the Lord's putting on my heart, I lean into this book. And it has, listen to me all, it has changed my life. You know, when people say things like that, you're like, really? Or did it just highly affect you? No, it changed my life. Doing it. And, and we can do this with anything with the Word of God. This just was something the Holy Spirit's like, camp on this forever. Like, this, you need this. And so I do. And I just go over it and over it and over it. So um, that is just something that um, I wanted to share just practically what that looks like when I said that I've gone over this book. Right now, I'm actually doing one of the funnest things I've ever done with Song of Solomon is um, I have a group of gals at my house on Tuesday mornings. That's why sometimes I'm not here. And um, we are going through the Song of Solomon. I think we've been on it a year and a half and we've gotten through, we're just starting chapter five. And it has just been two, three verses a time. And we talk about the meaning. Insight, just this last Tuesday, there was new revelation about the mountain. And I was like, oh, I really like that. This is number 10, number 11 through this book. And the Lord will still give you revelation if you want it. In anything. I'm not just talking about Song of Solomon. Any part of the word of God, if you will lean into it. Because the Lord says this right here. I want you to focus on that. I want you to give yourself to that. And I can tell you right now, the message of Song of Solomon, there is a call to every single one of us to give ourselves to it. It's intimacy with Jesus. Now, whether you use Song of Solomon or not, you are called to always, all of your days, set your eyes on him. You are my goal you are my prize. This is all about you. Amen. All of it is about him. 
And so that's just, the Lord's just used Song of Solomon in my life to do that. Um, when I was back in Colorado, I taught a ladies Bible study weekly and we would go over all different cool stuff. And I had a group of gals for um, years that, you know, 20 to 30 gals and there was a handful that stuck through, you know, the years and uh, we would study the word. And then one day I'm like, we're studying Song of Solomon. And most of them are like, how do you do, why, what? Like, it's just not really big in the body of Christ. It is more now than it was then. And I'm like, because we're going to learn about intimacy with Jesus. And then I would teach it every year and everyone would just eat it up. And we would go verse by verse by verse for 14 weeks is what it took us to do. And it was just fun. I did not get into this book to teach it. I got into it because I needed it. Like, Lord, touch my heart. Now, I'm at International House of Prayer teaching it, and I'm blown away that this is a gift that's been given to me that I get to share. I didn't know that along the way, but I knew I needed this, and so I plugged in. And so that's what I, I really felt like I was supposed to encourage you all. You know, um, I, I think I used this analogy with you guys before. Um, Intro is kind of like a cruise ship, and you're going along, and people are pointing islands out to you. Here's the island of intercessory prayer, and over here is the island of Israel. That's a pretty big island. Here is the island of meditating on the Word of God, and we're kind of just showing you all a preview of the islands, and then you lean in and you say, Lord, what islands do you want me to focus on right now in my life? And you focus on that. The other islands are still there and they're good. Maybe you take a day trip to that island, right? Right. But there are islands that he says focus on. So with Song of Solomon, um, no matter what the intimacy message, whether you use Song of Solomon or not, uh, the intimacy message is a massive island that we are supposed to explore always. Uh, the Song of Solomon, this teaching that you guys get four classes, so today and then the next four Fridays, um, it's going to be like I'm giving you a pretty good tour of the island, but there's a lot more to see. We're not going to hit every single scripture and all, all the deep meanings, but you guys are going to get a lot, and it's, it's super awesome. Let me see if I wanted to say anything else before we get going. Um, please free, feel free to, uh, we have plenty of time, so feel free to ask questions. Um, we will be stopping at times. It's something the Lord has me do while I'm teaching is we'll pause and kind of lean in and spend a little time in prayer, and then I'll teach some more just to give you guys a heads up for that. All right, any questions, comments before we get going? We're good? Awesome. All right, we will, so these notes, we probably won't get through all of these today, but I wanted to have enough, and then you'll get new ones next week and so on and so forth. The Song of Solomon covers the most important subject in your spiritual life having a relationship with God, intimacy with him. So Song of Solomon is one of the ways we can grow in this. So I'm going to share, why do we study Song of Solomon? Uh, Roman numeral 1b. There are three things... There are three things that we uh, want to emphasize in the Song of Solomon. God's emotions for his people, the first commandment, and then relationship leading to partnership. So uh, actually the study of God's emotions was a very new thing to me um, when I first connected with, with IHOP. Um, I, it wasn't that I was unaware of God's emotions. It was just that... 
I didn't know that I was supposed to purposely study and become a student of his emotions. And um, when I first started learning about that, I would hear uh, people say, like, get your Bible, start reading through it. And I don't mean from beginning to end, but read through where the Holy Spirit leads you to. And ask the Lord, like, Lord, show me your emotion. Show me your character here. Um, reading through, so, so of course I did it, you know, I'm like, that's what I need to do, I'm going to do that, and I, I got a big letter Bible for my treadmill, put it up there, and started to go through, especially the Gospels, love the Gospels, going through um, the Bible, and seeing God's emotions, and declaring them for me. So as we go through the Song of Solomon, we want to look for how he feels about his bride, you. Make it personal. Like you see him, he says, you ravish my heart. Well, I don't feel very ravishing, Lord, but I'm going to agree with you. I ravish his heart. He is touched by my small reach. My weak glance, right? He's touched by that. So we want to get it in our mouth. We want to study his emotions. What he says, what the bridegroom says about the maiden in Song of Solomon, he says about you. Amen. And we're going to talk a little bit about the characters, and you'll see that more. Also, the first commandment. So as we grow... Understanding God's good, he's kind, he's faithful. He really likes me a lot. He's for me, okay? As I'm learning his emotions, I'm also going to get pulled into and develop the first commandment. That I grow in loving him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. That I grow in wholeheartedness. I'm going to give you guys a secret. You absolutely cannot... Be wholehearted on your own. Amen. No way. You cannot will it enough, try enough, get yourself stirred up enough. I'm all in, God. I'm all yours. You know what I'm talking about? But you can say yes, and then Holy Spirit do that work in me. Create in me a clean heart. Have me walk in the first commandment. I can take in the truth that God loves me. I have to agree with it. I have to say it. I have to, Holy Spirit, help me believe this, empower me. And then, oh, turn that into love for him with everything in me. And then the third one is relationship leading to partnership. This was one of the things when I started studying Song of Solomon, I saw it. Because I really like to do things for Jesus, right? And we actually are supposed to. We're supposed to burn oil. We have the, the, the virgins, and they have their lamps, and they're burning their oil. This is good. This isn't bad. We're supposed to be burning our oil. But we don't want to burn more oil, the five foolish, than we take in, the five wise. We actually want to be cultivating our relationship with the Lord to empower us to partner with him in ministry. Again, we're not going to do very good if we're just, okay, this is what God's told me to do, so I'm just going to do it. Because I'm obedient to him and I'm just going to do it. It's like, no, help. Like, thank you, God, that you're good and you're faithful and you empower me to do this. Help me walk it out. And so it's relationship is being very, very, very important. Your relationship with the Lord is so important when it comes to walking in partnership with him, being able to do what he's called you to do. When we're getting weary, when we're getting tired, when we feel burned out, 
doing the work of the Lord, we need to stop and go, okay, uh, there's definitely been a disconnect in between me and the Lord, my heart connection with him, my um, absolutely dependency upon him. There's been something that's been disconnected, and I need to uh, connect that again. All right, Roman numeral two, uh, interpreting the Song of Solomon. There is the natural interpretation. This actually was not taught until, I meant to look this up. It's like the 14th century. That I mean, it was not taught as a natural interpretation for a long, long time. It was actually taught, the spiritual interpretation was taught, the rabbis taught it in the time of Jesus, before Jesus. The rabbis taught the spiritual interpretation of Song of Solomon. And who do you think the maiden was when they would taught, teach it? The maiden would have been Israel. So then when the church, the early church started to teach it, they started to teach it about the church, which would have included the saved believers and the saved Gentiles. And... Um, so when we look at it, we can see ourselves, we can see the church, and then we can see Israel. And we can pray for each of those groups, for ourselves out of it, pray for our people, for this community out of it, and then we can pray for Israel out of Song of Solomon. Um, okay, number one, symbolic or allegorical teaching can be very helpful to illustrate truths that are clearly established throughout Scripture. That's what I was talking about before. We don't read it and make up our own little meaning. We read it and it's backed up by the whole Bible, the allegorical, okay? See, Jesus did us a favor when he taught a um, parable, then he would teach the meaning, right? Right? So a lot of how Song of Solomon is interpreted is actually, it's interpreted by the Bible. So meanings that are throughout the Bible are what they mean in Song of Solomon. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so Song of Solomon teaches truth throughout, uh, or through a story or a long parable. It's written in poetic form and is a truth about God's heart that is found throughout the Bible. It is a literary form in which truths are presented through symbols. So our goal is not just to learn the symbolism. You really, that is one of your goals, to not just go, I'm just going to learn the symbolism, and that's cool. And it is, and it's fine. But that's not the goal. The goal is to turn the Song of Solomon into a conversation with the Lord leading to revelation in your inner man, leading to a closer relationship with the Lord. So you want to take the song, here's a goal, turn it into conversation with the Lord. And that truth during the conversation transforms you. Um, here's something that's not on your notes. I just made a little note on mine. Um, so I had a person come up to me after, I, an intern come up to me after I had taught this one time. And she's like, how do you know what all that stuff means? <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, because the smart people told me. Um, you know, that was what was going through my mind. But actually, I had just learned this new word. It is new to me. Probably a lot of you have heard it, but it's hermeneutics. So hermeneutics is the art and science of studying the Bible, interpreting the Bible. And so it's a process of the Bible, of the Bible interpreting the Bible. Did you guys hear what I said? The Bible interpreting the Bible. Example, we read about her neck a couple times in the Song of Solomon. Neck throughout the Bible represents the will. Like they were stiff-necked, yeah. right? They had set their will in the way they wanted to go. Uh -huh. Well, all of a sudden we're seeing, oh, all these places in the Bible, neck represents the will. 
Let's go take that over here into Song of Solomon. So the Bible is interpreting the Bible. Um, yes, it's H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-T-I-C-S. Hermeneutics. Go to the next page. All right, so these are the main characters in the Song of Solomon. We have King Solomon. He's also called the Beloved. He's also called the Bridegroom. And this represents Jesus in the spiritual interpretation. King Solomon is the picture of the triumphal... Christ Jesus as the bridegroom king. I love that picture in and of itself, the bridegroom king. See, I grew up knowing Jesus, that he loved me always, all the time. So I knew that part of him, but I also knew him as the king, the one who won the victory and we enforced the victory, right? And to see he's a bridegroom king, he won the victory and he is so in love with you. He didn't just win the victory because it was the right thing to do. He won the victory because he wanted to win your heart. Right? All of a sudden, that has a different meaning, doesn't it? Oh, you did that for me because you love me. The bridegroom king, the Shulamite maiden, in the spiritual interpretation, she's a picture of the bride of Christ. The church, we can use her as a picture of Israel and of us personally. When we see the maiden throughout the story, whether you're a guy or a gal, you're the maiden, okay? We are sons of God, you are the bride of Christ also, right? So we don't get confused about that. But when we see the maiden, and she's going through a situation in the Song of Solomon. She's so smart because she goes and talks to the bridegroom. And she gets the answer for her issue from the bridegroom. And so I can look at her, and she gets wounded by the elders, the watchmen. She gets wounded by the, the body of Christ. What is she doing? Because I've been wounded. Have you been wounded? Yep. We've all been wounded, right? What does she do? She goes and asks him, what do I do about this? And he tells her. And so we lean in. He's not just talking to a fictional character. He's talking to me. I'm the maiden. I'm part of the body of Christ. What are you saying to me? We have the daughters of Jerusalem. In the spiritual interpretation, they um, speak... They're sincere spiritually, but they're immature. So the daughters of Jerusalem, we don't see them a lot, but we see them a couple times. And they ask questions. That's good. And they'll go to the maiden when she is responding to the bridegroom's heart. And they'll be like, why are you doing that? That doesn't make sense in the natural. And then she gets to share with them why. And then we have the watchmen. Um, in the spiritual interpretation, they represent um, spiritual leadership. The watchmen were the keepers of the wall. They guarded the wall of the city to protect the people. Initially, the bride seeks their help, but eventually they strike and they wound her. So again, we want to lean into moments like that and go, oh, what's going to happen? Like, what does he tell her to do? These are truths for the body of Christ. In the Song of Solomon, um, it's, it's eight chapters long. It's split into two sections. The first four chapters focus on the bride's inheritance in Christ. What does that mean? It means the bride is realizing her gift in Jesus. Like how precious he is to her. She is falling in love with him. She is coming to know who he really is. And then the second half 
is when we see Jesus' inheritance in the bride. So this emphasizes he, him seeking that he, she is a blessing to him. Not just that the first half is she learns how much he's a gift to her. The second half, we learn, guess what? You're his inheritance. Like, you're a gift to him. Agree with it. I you really like me a lot. When I started studying this, of course, I got it in my prayer language. That is so important. But it changed the way I prayed. It changed the way I came to the Lord. And I mean, I remember the first time I prayed a certain way. And I remember I was desperate in the situation. I was really upset. I was distraught. And then I just came to the Lord and I said, okay, here I am, your daughter, the one you delight in. And I remember saying that and just being like, that's the truth. I'm asking for this because you love me. I'm asking you to move on this person's behalf. Not because of them. Mm -hmm. Because you love me. Mm -hmm. This is a different world. And we want to go there. We want that connection with the Lord that we really like. And then, and then we might not feel it. And we say, Holy Spirit, help me feel it. Like, make it real to me. Like, this truth doesn't feel real, but I'm agreeing with it because I know it's in the Word. Now make it real to me. Like, touch my emotions. I cannot pray like that and not feel right. the love of the Father on me. Like, just to say the truth of how He feels about us. So you're going to grow in that and lean into that on purpose, even if it's really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a story I like to tell a friend of mine that was in my Bible study for years, and I would talk this way even before I taught Song of Solomon, just because I had been immersing myself in it. And I would say the comment, um, you know, I I'm God's favorite. Did you know you're God's favorite? Yeah. You yeah. are. And so are you. Okay? And, and that doesn't really, in our mind, we're like, what? That doesn't really work. I have two kids, praise the Lord. One's a girl, one's a boy. I can say, my favorite girl, my favorite boy, right? But they have this thing where they, well, my son Josh has this thing where he's absolutely positive. He is my favorite. Positive. He tells people, I'm my mom's favorite. I'm like, ah. No, I am. We're so much alike, same personality. I'm her favorite. Now, my daughter Christina absolutely knows. She doesn't even have to argue about it. She knows she's my favorite, right? She knows that, right? So which one's my favorite? Both. Josh is my favorite Josh. In his uniqueness, in his, oh, he's got such a sensitive spirit. He really cares about the underdog. I love that about Josh. And Christina's my favorite. She loves people. She's funny. She's got this awesome sense of humor. I love hearing her tell stories. Just cracks me up. I love the uniqueness of Christina. And I love the uniqueness of Josh. I love them equally, but I love them uniquely. That's good. And that's how the Father feels about you. Yep. You are his favorite. Mm -hmm. So I would teach this, and I had a friend of mine, she's like, I just can't say that. I'm like, oh, well, you need to. Like, just get it out of your mouth and ask the Holy Spirit to make it real. Like, it will change your life. She's like, oh, I just can't. So years, she would tell me this. Years. And then one day she said, I was talking to the Lord about something, and I really needed him to move in this area. And she's kind of building the story up, telling me, and I'm like, did you say it? She's like, I did. I said, Father, I'm your favorite. 
could you move in this situation? That's a lot different than us knowing our technical prayers and just praying them. The word is the word. I love to pray the word. But the word connected to the Father's heart changes me. It changes you. So that's what we lean into when we are going through the songs. Um, Roman numeral four is about praying the word. Uh, have you guys had teaching on pray reading the word yet? Okay. So um, this just gives a little snapshot of that, ways to do that with the Song of Solomon, and I highly recommend it. All right, before we jump into the first verse, is there any questions, comments, things you want to say? Where did you say about Song of Solomon praying the word there was some, where was that at? Or four there? Um, Roman numeral six. Um, no, sorry, Roman numeral four. Turning the song into prayer dialogue with Jesus. Yep. And that'll just give you some specific... Um, ways to do that. I really recommend you all take these um, papers into uh, the prayer room and over this next week before we get do this again next Friday, you know, grow in it. Start putting it to practice. <clears throat> yes. I don't know. I know that the prayer that I just told you guys that I prayed, like the first time I remember it was memorable, um, was probably two, two and a half years after I started studying the Song of Songs. Um, because God's really nice and very kind. And he knew I was going to need it in the future for the struggles that would come. And so I had already been really uh, leaning in really strong. So, and that is something that you can say, hey, you know, someone's like, well, I tried that. Or I, I, I learned that. You know, like, well, did you try it for a decade? Right? Right. Because that's when transformation happens is over a period of time. You, you, um, I would have really crampy legs uh, when we would walk. My legs would just cramp up, and uh, I had a doctor tell me, um, oh, you need iron. And so I started taking iron. And do you know what? The next day, my legs felt the same. And I took it the next day, and my legs felt the same. And I took it the next day, and my legs still cramped up. Okay, so it wasn't until I was consistent after a while, that all of a sudden one day I'm like, oh my gosh, yep. I don't even know when they left, but I don't have leg cramps anymore, right? And that's how the word of God works on us. When we go and we say, I give myself to this Holy Spirit, help, empower me, anoint me to believe, to receive this truth. Thank you, Father, for this. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and making a way so that I can jump into this and it can be real in my life. Yeah. And we do it over and over and over and over and over again. And then one day we're like, that didn't freak me out like it would have once before. That didn't, but it, the flesh is still there. The flesh is always there. Like somebody's rude to you, the flesh is like, ah. <laughs> I don't know one person that's gonna be cured of that, right? But instead of dwelling on it, have it overtaking our mind, all of a sudden we're like, that's not how God feels about me. Like, he really likes me. And that goes. It, it transforms us. All right, we're going to jump in to the first verse. I didn't put it on there, but you can you can write it in. I'm your favorite. That was free. Yeah. 
I'll talk about it later, actually, because he calls her fairest. He goes, you are fairest among women, which means you're my favorite. It means you're my favored one. I love that. I'm his favored one. Like, he looks upon me with favor. He really likes us a lot. We put that in our language. So, Saga Solomon 1.1. 1, 1. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. It's another reason why people call it the Song of Songs. You can call it the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon or the Songs, and we'll know what you're talking about. Um, Solomon was actually a songwriter. He wrote 1,005 songs. And this was considered the preeminent. Um, it was the Song of Songs. Roman numeral six. The theme of the Song of Songs is to encounter Jesus in the word. So verse two, this is the Shulamite speaking. You'll notice that I'll put on each verse who is speaking. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on, but it's just helpful for you all to see. Um, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Let him, it would be like saying, Father, let the Holy Spirit touch me with the truth of this word. I want you to see that, and we'll, we'll, I'll explain a little bit more. It's one of my favorite things to pray out of the songs. Father. Touch my heart with the truth of your word. I don't want to just read it. I want it emblazoned inside of me. I don't want to just understand what this means. I want it to be a truth that empowers me. Touch my heart with the truth of your word. <clears throat> this actually reminds me of the Ephesians 1 prayer. Father of glory, right? She says, let him. She's talking to the Father. Let him touch me with the truth of the word of God. Father of glory, give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Open the eyes of my understanding. Flood with light so that I can see the truth. Touch my heart with the truth of your word. Now notice, it's the kiss of the word. This is an intimate, personal conversation with the Lord around his word. Touch me, kiss me with the truth of your word. Touch my heart in an intimate way. It's not a high five and it's not a handshake. It's a kiss. It's close up. It's personal. It's, it really, when we hear the word, you're hearing me speak right now. This is not a kiss. Okay? This is me explaining the word of God to you, teaching the word of God to you. And then I might say something and you feel, oh, I like that. And then you go talk to the Lord about it. And you get the kiss of the word. Lord, speak that to me. Make that real to me. I can point you to green grass, but you have to go eat it. Right? And so this is what we're being provoked here is leaning in. Father, touch my heart with the truth of your word. Deuteronomy 8.3 and Matthew 4.4, 4, it's under B. It says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The rabbis in the day actually had what they called the kiss of the Torah. It was the kiss of the word. They would actually kiss the word of God and then open it up and read it. Right? Yeah? It's the kiss of the word. Can you imagine... 
during this time you're reading this or the rabbi's reading it to, and they're talking about the kiss of the word and they're like, oh, reverence for the word of God. That's what they're going to connect with. We're going to connect with, ah, oh, Holy Spirit, make this real. Like this is the words of life. Make it real to me. Touch me with this truth. Um, letter C, there's three metaphors for spiritual intimacy with God in the songs. It's the one that we just read of. It's called the divine kiss. We will also read about the divine embrace and in chapter 8, the divine seal. The bride's journey starts with vision to receive the kiss of the word, and it ends with her being sealed in God's love. So Solomon, the writer of Song of Solomon, it feels a little bit reminiscent of his own experience with God here. Because we know the story where God comes to Solomon and he says, um, ask me, what do you want me to give you? We all know the story, right? And he says, Solomon says, now give me wisdom and knowledge for who can judge this great people of yours. In other words, Lord, give me discernment on how to lead these people. And then God says to him, because this was in your heart and you have not asked for riches and wealth and honor and life or the life of your enemy, nor have you asked for long life, but you've asked for wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you and I'll give you riches and wealth and honor. All the other stuff he got, but he asked for the right thing. That's right. In his heart. Yep. God was pleased with what he asked for. And when we, you know, uh, talk to the Lord about our needs, it's great to ask for the things that we need. But first and most, we ask for him, a touch from him. I want to grow more in love with you. I want to know you more. Kiss me with the truth of your word. Make it real to me, personal to me, Lord. Show me in your word. Make these promises that I read real to me. So I can be reading the word of God and I can agree with the word. But it doesn't mean I feel it. It doesn't mean like it's real. Like I can agree with it like that's true. I believe that. But we can say, I believe this, Lord. Now I'm asking you to kiss me with it. Like, make it real and personal to me in my life. Do that. Do that work. Like, I can't do that part. I can ask him for it, but I can't do that part. So uh, your love is better than wine. So, so she makes this statement. She says, kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. Touch my heart with the truth of your word. For your love is better than wine. This is why. This is why she wants a touch from him. Because his love is better than anything. She knows this truth. Like, Lord, help us know this truth. Better than wine. His love is better than anything else. You can read in the word, I did this study where I looked at the wines of the world are in the Bible, and then the wines of the Spirit or of the Lord are in the Bible, okay? So think of it this way. Your love is better than anything the world could offer. Easy one, right? His love, me knowing him, is also better than his promises. Yeah, they're actually yeah. better than being used by him in ministry. That's right. They're actually better than all the things on my prayer list getting answered. Even though it's his will and I'm going to ask for them, right? I'm not talking about getting rid of that. I'm still going to ask for them, believe for them. It is his will. It is his desire. But first and foremost, I want him. 
Uh, another prayer that I prayed, um, I remember the day I prayed it. You know one of those prayers that you pray and you're like, oh, that's kind of scary, praying that. Like, Lord, send me anywhere. I'll do anything for you. You know, one of those. And I remember being like, okay, God, um, anything that's in my life right now that's not from you, I want it gone because it's in between you and me. And then I said, and anything that's in my life that's in the wrong place, I want it put in the right place and not between you and me. Okay, let's do that. Like, I don't know how to do that. Do you all know how to do that? No. But I can ask for it because his love's better. Like, your love's better, Lord, than this being okay in my life. Your love is better. My heart posture towards you is the most important. So if I establish this heart posture towards the Lord that's good, like you and me, not perfect because as long as we're in this human flesh until Jesus returns, we're still going to be walking this out. We don't come to the end of it. Lord, but you and me, that's what's most important. And then show me how to walk out the rest. I'm not ditching the promises. I'm not ditching my family. I'm not ditching my ministry, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a heart posture. And then what happens is when we grow in that heart posture that really he is what matters, first and most, and we grow in that, then when we have disappointment come in ministry, when we have disappointment come in family, when we have disappointment come in situations, it doesn't take us out because it wasn't first and most in the first place. He is. And he's not moving. He's not changing. He's awesome. And he loves me. And he's still here. And I'm like, okay, your love's better. Touch me with the truth of your word, Lord. Because I know all I really need is you. Like, you're first and most. Okay, um, page four, I'm going to read these verses, and then I want to hear what's touching your heart. Psalms 4, 7. So on the premise of his love is better than wine. Psalms 4, 7. You have put gladness in my heart more than in the seasons that, get, <clears throat> in the seasons that grain and wine increase. You have put gladness in my heart more than things going as planned. You have put gladness in my heart more than getting what I wanted. Even if it's good. Even if it's his will. He is the one who touches our heart. He is the one who does that. Psalms 27.4. This is David. One thing I have desired of the Lord. That I will seek. Now he says one thing, and then he says three things. So these three things make up the one thing that he's seeking, okay? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Okay, this one thing I desire. I want to be with you every day, all day long, Jesus. I want to dwell with you all the days of my life. I want to see how beautiful you are. I want to see your inner goodness. I want to see the kindness of your heart and your mercy towards me. I want to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and I want to inquire in his temple. I want to have conversations with him. I want to talk to you, Lord, and I want to hear you talk to me. Don't you want that? I want that. One thing I desire. First and most. First and most. Your love is better than everything else. First and most. You're my one thing. I want to be with you. I want to see who you really are. And I want to be in fellowship with you all the time. All right, we're going to pause and pray over this. 
Does anyone have anything to say first? Or question? Comment? You love it, right? Do you love that verse? I love that verse. I love that I know my Father God has affection towards me. And when I say, Lord, I'm asking you to come and make your word real to me, that he's faithful to do it. I love that I can relax and not try to figure everything out, but I can actually know right now, you all, right now, at this moment in time, with everything that's going on in your life, you have him. You have all that you need to be satisfied and happy right now. Is that crazy? I don't feel that way. You know why I know I don't feel that way? Because I'm not satisfied and happy with things that happen around me. But then I can pull myself around and go, oh, that's right. Your love's better yeah. than all of this going is planned. Your love's better than me getting my way. Your love's better. Even if my way is good. That's right. Even if my desires are godly. His love, knowing him, having him with me, having conversation with the king of the universe, and he leans in when I talk. Yeah, he good. leans in when I turn my attention to him. That is enough if I truly know and believe that. So we get it in our language. So Lord, we just come to you right now. And we ask you, touch us with the truth of your word. How you feel about us. Touch us in a personal way, in an intimate way. That you love us. We're asking you for that, Lord. Yes, Touch us. Lord. We cannot do this. Only you can. Only you can. Touch us with the truth of your word. Your love, Lord, is better than all else. Your love is better. than everything the world has to offer. Your love, knowing you, is better than even your promises. Though we ask you for them, we believe you for them, Lord. They are not our goal. You are. They are not our treasure. You're our treasure. Now, Lord, I ask you to come and make that real even more. Increase that truth within us that we truly know and feel the love of the Father for us and that we love him in return and we are satisfied. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Only you can do that in us. We can't will it. Only you can do it. We ask you to do it, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Your love is better. Make this truth real to us. You are our one thing. Nothing before you. Touch our hearts with the truth of your word, Lord. Help us to lay down distractions. Help us put things that are important in their rightful place. That they would not come before you. Your love is worth it, Lord. Thank you. We love you. <clears throat> we love you, Jesus. Amen.
Amen. Yes? Yeah. That's what we do. All right, verse 2. 2 through 4, that was verse 2. I'm going to read 2 through 4. Roman numeral 7. This is the bride's life vision. She's going to tell us her goal. I don't even think she realizes she's saying her goal right now. And just to let you know, this is a great life vision to have. What we just talked about is an awesome life vision. Like, that's what I want. That I want to do that all my days, every day, until he returns. I want my eyes set upon him. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Because of the fragrance of your good ointment, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins love you. I'm going to pause there, um, and then we'll come back to the rest of the verse. So she has this life vision of, oh, I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read the rest. Um, and then it says, draw me away. And then the daughters and her say together, we will run after you. The Shulamite says, the king has brought me into his chamber. The daughter said, we will be glad and rejoice with you. We will remember your love more than wine. And then the Shulamite says, rightly do they love you. So we see this theme, um, this life vision that the Shulamite maiden has. And it's to fall in love with Jesus and then to run in ministry and partnership with Jesus and others. That's her life vision. In that order. Did you guys catch that? In that order. She wants to fall in love with Jesus, receive his love for him, right? Love him in return. And then she wants to run with the body of Christ in partnership with Jesus. Okay? So lots of times we get those kind of messed up, don't we? Yep. You know, we're like, hey, what do you want to do? Let's do something for Jesus. And we feel closer to Jesus when we do this stuff for Jesus. Until somebody offends us, then we don't feel so close to Jesus. And we don't want to do the stuff, right? But when we connect with him and we have his heart and his motives, and we're not talking 100% until he returns. We're talking about our heart posture is bent this way. Jesus, I want to do what you tell me to do when you tell me to do it through your power, with your people. And because I have fallen in love with you, and I know that you love me, when the person comes to offend me, I'm not going to run away. I'm not going to pull back. Right. That's how it happens. We're infused with his love for us, our love for him, and then it turns into love for the body. Right. It's the only way. It literally is the only way. That we walk through this journey with weak and broken people in ministry, in the body of Christ, and we don't walk in constant offense. It will come to tempt you, right? But you have fallen in love with Jesus. And so then you stop and you're like, Jesus, how do you see that person? He's like, I really like him a lot. I died for him. They're my kid. You're like, oh. You take it personal that I'm mad at him, right? Lord, yeah, I do. Oh, I don't want, I don't want that in you, Carrie. That's going to hurt you. Oh, so you love them and you love me. So we start to have this conversation with him and we're able to lay offense down. Okay, let's go over the verses a little slower. So she says, I want you to touch my heart with the truth of your word because I know that your love is better than anything else. And then she says, the reason I know this is because of the fragrance of your good ointment. Your name is ointment poured forth. I know that you're better because you you smell really good. This is the emotions of God part. 
I've looked at you and I've seen it's the fragrance. Where's the fragrance of a flower? It comes, it blooms and the inner life of the flower comes out, right? The fragrance of his good ointment, the fragrance of his character has won my heart. I've looked at him, I've spoken to him, I've heard his voice, I've seen his inner life towards me, towards the body. I've seen to it who he is, and I can't help but go, his love's better. Like, he's the best. I, I wish it was this way, but I have him. Like, he's always kind. He's always generous. He's always nice to me. He corrects me out of his love. He directs me out of his love. I know his nature. And because I know his nature, I realize how, like, it's the fragrance of his good ointment. And it says, your name is ointment poured forth. Name in the Bible denotes character. Name denotes character. Uh, uh, we know that God changes people's names in the Bible, right? You're not this, you're this. You'll see it all over the word of God. And it says here, your name is ointment poured forth. Now, I have fallen in love with you because I smell how good your inner ointment is. Why? Because it's been poured forth. You actually can do this on purpose. God, you're good. You're faithful. You're faithful when I'm faithless. That's right. That's who you are. You can't change that. Even when I mess up, that's who he is. It's who he is. I pour forth his name. When I pour forth his name, it touches my inner man. That's right. And goes, oh, yeah, that's right. And then it comes up, and I pour forth his name, and I go, oh, yeah, that's right. Right? And then I pour forth his name when my friend comes to me and says, I have this problem. And I'm like, oh, did you know how good he is? He's super faithful. This is who he is. He is the true, and he is the faithful witness. He does not lie. When he said that he would work it out for good, he meant it. I'm pouring forth his name, his fragrance, his nature. It fills the room, doesn't it? Man, you've been around somebody like that? I have a friend that if I'm bummed, I know I can call her up. And she's not going to go, oh, yeah, that's really sad. I'm really sad for you. That's bad. This is what she's going to do. Yeah, well, that's good. What did he tell you, Carrie? I'm like, he said he'd complete the work. That's right, he did. And he will. He's, she's pouring forth his nature to me that's stirring, stirring up a truth I already know that I was ignoring because the answer to the problem seemed a lot more important to, than him at the time. For me to be okay, we got to have the problem fixed. Instead of for me to be okay, I need to gaze at Jesus and see how good he is. He's not changing. People change. Situation changes. Churches change. Things change around us. He does not. We can be sure he is who he said he is all along. He's really, really good. Really good. He's super kind. He's very, very faithful to you because you're his favorite, right? right? He looks upon you and has grace and mercy. It's who he is. I like to get the picture of um, the ointment being poured forth. It's like Mary pouring the oil on Jesus' feet. She lavished it. And it said that the scent filled the whole room. When we're, when we're with others, when we're by ourselves, and we begin to pour forth his nature, speak out 
who he is. Go through the word, see him. Like I remember the day I was reading about the the leper that wanted to be healed from leprosy and it said, and you know, in those days, the culture was you didn't touch them. They were unclean. They actually had to stay far away. And then they had to yell, unclean, unclean, unclean. Can you imagine? You're walking by a city and you just have to yell, I'm unclean. They had to wear rags, ripped up clothes to distinguish, stay away from me. And it says that he said to Jesus, if you are willing, will you make me whole? And Jesus says, I'm willing. And then it says, Jesus reached out and touched him. Do you know Jesus didn't have to touch him? We see lots of times in the word where he cast out something and it left. He didn't have to touch him. Isn't that interesting? And I remember reading that and going, oh my gosh, this guy I haven't touched in years. You didn't have to do it that way, Jesus. You're just really nice. He's really kind. And so we start to see the nature of Jesus, and it transforms how we relate to him and how we relate to one another. It transforms how we see ourselves and relate to ourselves. When you mess up, We should be relating to ourselves through his fragrance, through his nature, through how he sees us. So that's why we need to get this. It, it's like vital. This is like we have to have this truth in us, how good he is, how he pursues us, how kind he is. John 17, 26, he says, I have declared to them your name. Jesus is saying this about the Father. I have declared to them your name. You know how he declared it? He did declare it through his words, but he mostly said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. Right. That's how he acted, that he reached out and touched the leper, the sick. He healed them. He cast out the demons. He did that. He loved the unlovely. He says, I have declared to them your name, and I will declare it. That the love which you loved me. This is Jesus speaking. He says, Father, I've declared your nature, your way of dealing with people. I have showed them who you are. That the love that you love me will be in them. And I in them. I want them to know us, Father. I want them to be with us. I want them to experience that. That was exactly what Adam was saying about the fire. What was it? Burning heart. Yes, the burning heart. It is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit burning with love, and they invite us in. Right? And you know what we do? Yes. I don't deserve it. I don't earn it. But I want it. Right. I want your nature, your love. I want to glimpse the love that the Father has for the Son. And the Son that the love that has for the Father. And that that's how they love me. Right? Yeah. We say yes to that. We do. We say yes to that. Yeah. Yes. Um, a number three, draw me away. So this is her uh, cry is to be drawn away to him. And it's singular. It speaks of intimacy with God. It's a one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with him being drawn close to God's heart, speaks of relationship, private interactions with him. So she says, draw me away. And then together they all say, we will run after you. 
So it's not just singular and it's not just plural. Singular is draw my heart to your heart, God. Plural is we, the body of Christ, I'm going to run with them after Jesus. Um, the New American Standard translates this a little different. Draw me after you and let us run together. We want to be drawn to the Lord and we want to run with him and the body of Christ together. Number five, the king has brought me into his chamber. Again, this is singular. It's personal. It's our deep personal times with the Lord. It's a chamber moment. It's private and it's intimate. Lord, what are you saying to me? If we are living off of everybody else's chamber moments, it's not going to carry us through. That's right. We have to have our own chamber moments so that we can run with the body of Christ. The next part of the verse is, we will be glad and rejoice. It's, it's Again, it's plural. It's with the body of Christ. I have spent time with the Lord, personally growing, more in love with him. And then I come with the body of Christ, and we are glad and we rejoice in you, Lord. We will remember your love more than wine. The first part is, his love is better than wine, right? And then they say, we will remember your love more than wine. I, I like to think of this as very intentional. The, the last part of the verse is, rightly do we love you. So that's the goal. Like, we want to grow in love. So we're going to be drawn away, but we're still going to stay with the body. We're going to go into the chamber, but we're going to come together, rejoice, be glad in him, right? And then they say, we will remember your love more than wine. And so, again, I think of this as very intentional. I am going to intentionally remember that his love is better than everything else. Because my emotions don't feel that way. My thinker doesn't think that way, right? I have situations in my life, and I'm going, I really need to focus on this. This is really bad. If we can get it good, I can be okay. No, we're going to remember on purpose his love is better. And I like to say we remember best with our mouth. That's right. That's how we remember best. Now, I like to journal, so I like to write things down. I have sticky notes. I've got scriptures that I want to remember. I have a whiteboard in my room where I exercise. And if I hear something on a podcast or I'm listening to the word and it hits me, I write it down. And I'm being intentional so I can remember it, right? And that's good. But not if I just don't ever revisit it. Yep. Yeah. We will remember on purpose we must declare from our mouth, God, you're good. You're the God of the impossible. You're in the middle of an impossible situation and you stop. And you're like, oh, I'm feeling anxious. You know what? Actually, negative emotions are super helpful. Think of them as an alarm system, like a fire alarm. And it's like, oh, you got a problem. You need to go talk to God. That's good. Right? All of a sudden, I'm feeling nervous. I have the fear of man on me. I have, um, you know, a negative situation, and I'm like, can't get it. I'm just worried, and I'm getting in knots over it. Those are alarms going off. Carrie, you need to go talk to God. You need to remember his love right now. Okay, so on purpose, Lord, what are you saying about this? You're good. You're faithful. You have a plan. You have a purpose. You're doing this thing. I can talk about it, I can debate about it, I can think about it, but in the end, I want to know his nature over it and what he's saying to me over it. Yeah, that's true. So Lord, right now, we just ask you 
Touch our hearts, Lord. Touch our hearts with this truth. We absolutely know, Lord, we can't get this on our own. It must come from you. Father, would you reveal yourself to us more? Jesus, shine your nature, pour your nature upon our minds, upon our emotions. Learning it won't do us any good without your touch. Holy Spirit, Spirit of light and truth, shine this truth upon our inner man. Yes. Help us. Help us, empower us, anoint us. Fill us up with your truth, Lord. Your love is better. We just say it. Your love is better. It's better than that situation getting figured out. Lord, we thank you that you're a good God and that you're working in all of our circumstances, in all of our people, Lord, because you are good and faithful. But first and most, Lord, we set our eyes upon you. You are our bridegroom king. The king who is an affection over us, your bride. Thank you. Make that real to us, Lord. Open our eyes. Let us see it. We love you. We need you. We need you, God. We need you, God. We love you. We love you. We do love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, we're going to do a little bit more, and we'll wrap it up here. Um, next page, Roman numeral eight. <clears throat> hey, does anyone have comments, questions? I just love that you gave a text coming up, and now there's so much about the song of Solomon that we're going to have to get to it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. really um, encourage you all you can you can get online and get uh, the passion translation I don't know if it has the footnotes online available though but like here's an example you can see how many footnotes it has it's really really good and they they um, dissect the Hebrew yeah so it's super helpful all right um, so we come into a new part. Now, I love what we just did. Like, that's my favorite. I like, I have several favorite parts, but that is one of my favorite parts. Is yes, the whole just picture of her asking the Lord to touch her heart and then her growing in love and feeling his, you know, the pouring forth of his nature over her. Um, now we come into a part where her journey begins. It's the paradox of grace. And so the verse, and you, you've heard this thing for sure. Um, sorry, I'll go back up to letter A. The paradox of faith is that we are dark in our carnal nature, yet we are lovely to God. Some emphasize, in the body of Christ, some emphasize how sinful we are, the darkness of our heart, and others how beautiful we are to God in Christ. But both of these truths must be understood to understand our relationship with God. I thought I was reforming my flesh. You know your sin nature, your flesh? 
It's bent towards pride. It's bent towards offense. I thought I was reforming it, like getting it to not be. It will always be. The flesh is not getting better. Your sin nature is not going away. What's happening is your spirit man is getting in agreement with God, and it's like the adult, and it tells the little child flesh, sit down and be quiet. You don't get your way. You don't get to drive the car. I'm driving the car. Right. I'm the adult. And so just getting that understanding, I thought it was leaving. I thought I was reforming it. No. Your flesh is actually always prone to be against God and his word. The sin nature wants sin. It's not going away. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay? But I have the Holy Spirit living in my spirit man. I have God, the Holy Spirit, living in my spirit man. That's the adult in this family, right? And I get to listen to him. I get to listen to the Holy Spirit in my spirit man. He is the one who empowers me to say no to the sin nature. So verse 5, she says, I am dark but lovely. She has this revelation. Oh, I have darkness upon me, but I'm lovely. I want us to actually go look at that before we go on to the rest of the verse, and then we'll come back and read that. I'm dark in my flesh and carnal nature. This is not, I feel bad about who I am. That's not what we're talking about. I just, I'm dark. I just can't get it right. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about I get offended, and I'm like, oh, look at that. I don't have to go into a big lament over my offense in the sense of <clears throat> if it's an ongoing sin, there is a time for, like, huge sorrow and lament. I'm talking about everyday life. We're going through life. And somebody says something rude, a checker's kind of snarky, and we get offended. And then we're like, oh, man, you would think I'd learned this by now. No, that's your flesh. I like to say it's my humanness. I had this conversation with God one time. I'm like, oh, I why? He's like, because I, you're human. <laughs> oh, I have a sin nature. My sin nature wants to get offended. Now I have a choice. Do I listen to it and obey it? Or do I lean into the Holy Spirit inside of my spirit, man? Right? Our, our soul is the other part of us. So we have the sin nature. We have the, the spirit, the Holy Spirit in our spirit. And then there's the soul, which is the mind, the will, and the emotions. It's your thoughts. It's your desires. And it's how you feel. And in and of itself, those are not bad or good. Thoughts, feelings, and desires are not bad or good. They can be influenced by bad or good. So if I'm having a bad desire or a bad thought or a bad feeling, guess who I'm listening to? Your flesh. My flesh. My sin nature. The baby is running the show right now. It is throwing a fit, and it wants its way. It could also be the enemy coming and lying to us, okay? So I can stop, and I can go, oh, that person just offended me. But guess what? I don't have to listen to the baby throwing a fit. I can actually go, Holy Spirit, give me your grace and heart for this person right now. And I can react in kindness. So she says, I am dark, but I am lovely. I have a sin nature. I have a carnal nature. Romans 7, 18 says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh. Isn't that nice that Paul actually clarified? Yes. He says, I know that in me, let me make this clear, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Did you all get that? Nothing good dwells. For to will is present. In other words, I want to act right. To will is present within me, but how to perform what is good, I don't find. 
In, in ourselves, we actually can't make us be nice. We really can't. I mean, we might be able to fake it on the outside while the inside is like cringing. You know, in ourselves, we cannot make ourselves be nice. First, or 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and he said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. This is the Lord speaking to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then listen to what he says. He says, therefore, most gladly, I'd rather boast in my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'd rather go, I can't do this. Then be like, okay, do better, Carrie. Just do better. No, I can't do it. My flesh is dark. And then she says, but I'm lovely. In, in the sight of God, because I am in Christ, right now, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Right now. Is this making sense? Are you getting the picture? It's really important to get this stuff because otherwise we get hung up on us instead of focused on him. The enemy wants us hung up on the weakness of our flesh. Go ahead and say it. I'm dark. In my flesh, I don't have the power to do this. But guess what? Don't stay there, right? Right. I have the Holy Spirit within me. Greater is he that's in me than what's in the world, my flesh. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, now my focus is on him. I'm dark, yes. In myself, I cannot do it. But I'm lovely in Christ. Philippians 1.6, being conformed to this very thing. He who has begun the good work in you, he'll complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, you will be on this journey of the darkness of the flesh, the enemy and the world is trying to get your attention, your affection, and your devotion. It is trying to get you to obey it until he returns. But as we renew our mind to the truth, that who you are, God, greater are you in me. You call me righteous. You call me lovely. This is the truth. I don't have to obey the world, the flesh, and the devil. I don't have to obey it. I don't, you do not have to ever obey it. When we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us, when we call upon him and say, show me more. Like, open my eyes to see this truth. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he who made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, Jesus, who knew no sin, took your sin. Why? So that you would become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am dark, but I am lovely. I am weak in my flesh, but I have the Holy Spirit's power within me. That is the truth. And so as we go through Song of Solomon, we want to keep this posture of, oh, 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 this is, you know, we don't want to do this. This is the answer. I just need to get this, and then I'm going to be good. This is what you do is, I need you, God, use this book to uh, encourage me, to show me, but Holy Spirit, I can't do this just by learning the word. I have to do this by your grace. In my flesh, I want to come up with a plan. Anybody else like that in here? In my, I mean, I'm a planner. I got lists. I got plans. I got stuff like that all the time. Okay? So in myself, in our nature, don't we want to earn it, come up with it, work for it? Just give me the seven things to do and I'll do them. Right? That's a, that's a natural man nature. Some people more than others. And he's going, no, 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 come to me. Come to me. Ask me to empower you. Ask me to enlighten you. Ask me to teach you. So having
having that perspective is super helpful in this journey of, I am dark. Yep. There's that sin nature. It's poking me. Try to do it yourself. Reason this out. Figure it out. Or you can't do it. And you're a failure. That's the dark of the, the flesh. But no, I, I'm falling in love with him who speaks truth to me. Not only does he speak truth to me, he empowers me to walk it out. So we can hear the truth from God and go, yeah, I agree with that. I don't feel it. I can't do it. No, you can't. Then you ask for him to empower you. I agree with this. Now make it real to me. Like empower me to walk it out. Right. Empower me to feel it, to know it, to be to be firm on this truth that you say I'm lovely. He says I'm lovely. Right? Right. We're gonna stop there. Yes. I was so distracted. I'm not even sure if Jesus and I connected in that two hours I was in there. Like, I was just distracted about thoughts and things, and then I would talk to Jesus a little bit and get a little touch. And then, you know, so, of course, I had a conversation with the Lord. Lord, I feel like that was, I didn't do well. And he's like, oh, you talked to me. You showed up. That really made me happy. I'm like, really? Really? Yeah, it really made him happy. Okay, Lord, I, I don't want to be distracted. Help me with that. Touch me. Touch the dark, normal, flesh, humanness stuff. Touch that, Lord. Help me not listen to that, but listen to you. Touch the part of me that wants to believe that over what I believe you. Touch that. Help Help me, God. I agree with you. So we thank you, Lord, um, for this time in your word. I do thank you that you call us lovely. Yes. We are lovely to you. <laughs> you really, really love us. You really love us. You know, just say, Lord, you really love me. You really love me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you that you say I'm lovely because of Jesus makes me lovely. That's right. Not because of anything I do or don't do, but because of Jesus I'm lovely. Thank you. I ask you, Lord, stir this up in us. Hallelujah. Make it real, Holy Spirit. Enlighten the eyes of our understanding and blaze in this truth upon our heart that we are lovely to God even in our weakness, that he cherishes us even in our failure. Thank you. Thank you. You're so good. You're so kind. We love you. Help us get this in our mouth. Touch our emotions with this truth. Touch our mind. Touch our inner man with this truth, Lord. We love you. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, awesome. Any comments, any questions? Then we're going to be done. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, the accuser. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
So I'm one of those people that are, yeah, I'm super aware of my inner, yeah, thought, thoughts and stuff. I'm kind of, and I just have lots of conversations with the Lord over it. And I will actually ask the Lord, like, Lord, you know, why did I talk that way to that person? Like, I feel bad about the way I talk to them. Like, why did I do that? And, and, and not just, Lord, help me not do that, and I'm not going to do it anymore. You know? But, like, what is it that you want to tell me? What is it that you want to explain to me? And I'll just really get myself quiet and, and try to hear what he's saying to me. And it usually lines up with verb. I mean, it always lines up with the scripture, but it's usually a specific verse that he'll bring up lots of times. Or just like a little phrase. And then um, I agree with it out loud. I'll go, I, I agree with you, God, what you say about me. And I agree with the heart that you've given me. And I agree that the Holy Spirit lives within me and he empowers me. And I choose not to dwell on that. And I choose to dwell on you. Help. Like, a lot. That's what I'll say, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the scripture that she shared in uh, Romans, you know, that um, I do those things I shouldn't do. All that. Romans 8. You should study Romans 8. It is the answer. And it starts saying, like, there is no condemnation yep. in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to tell you why. Because those that, that follow after the Spirit. So study Romans 8. It is awesome. It, it redeems you from Romans 7. Said, I, yeah. On her comment, yeah. um, she was talking, as she said it, she, I see it like a self-condemnation mm -hmm. on her own self, where yours is towards other people. Okay, so are the roots the same? Yeah, mine is a self yeah. but, but I'm talking about I'll get condemned at myself for getting upset right. at people. Right. So it's the same thing where, like, if it's, if it's this inner dialogue that we're having, that we're beating ourselves up, that we're like, you need to do better, you need to... I mean, I have so many cool, awesome life plans yeah. for, like, my day, exercise, read the word, <laughs> cook my good-for-you food, yeah. like, I have them, um, and, then, you know, yeah, all that stuff. I have so many of that, and I can feel so bad about... Didn't do it again. Ah, I missed it again. Ah, I didn't do it again. Or going into the prayer room and not feeling good about my time there because of me. Not because of anyone else, because of me. I didn't do it right. You know, all those kind of things. Or I'm mad at someone. Now I'm mad at me for being mad at that person. You know, all those things that enemy just tries to come and get our attention. Get your attention off of God and get it on you or somebody else that offended you. That's what he wants to do. And just being aware of that and go, I see you. And I'm not partnering with you. I partner with God. He is the truth. I'm not going with you. And you do that, and an hour later when you feel bad about it again, you do it again. And then five years later, after you've done that, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I didn't do that well, and I don't feel super horrible about it. Wow, Lord, you've done a work in me. Okay. And, and defeat that condemnation spirit. That okay. Jesus. Okay. With a prayer, like just see an example of how you how we can do this in the prayer room. Okay. So when we're when these things are coming. I love it. How do we do this? I love it. Let's, let's okay. See. So you're in the prayer room. You've just gotten distracted for the fourteenth time, <laughs> and you're kind of frustrated because you wanted the word of the Lord, you know, and you're beating yourself up, and then you're like, no, nope, no, nope, that's not the truth, Lord. Your love is better than me doing this right. Your attention and your devotion on me is better than me walking this out right. Because your name is what I put forth. Your nature is kind and gracious. Your nature is forgiving. Your nature is patient, Lord. That's who you are, and that's who you are towards me. So because of that, Lord, even though I'm dark in this area, in my flesh, uh -huh. and I acknowledge it's not going away, 
I just say because of who you are, I'm lovely to you. Because you're gracious. Because you're merciful. Because you're kind. It's who you are. I walk. That's who you are. Lovely before you. And I agree with that. I am righteous with you. How long that take? Two minutes max? We do this, that thing doesn't take out our day. That's right. That thing doesn't consume our mind. And like I said, and then an hour when the enemy comes or our flesh rises up, either way, and it tries to come on us again, we stop and we do it again. And we get those truths in the chamber because we spent time talking to them about it. And then when the condemnation comes, we walk it out in a two-minute prayer. That's right. And we're like, that's the truth. Let's go. Let's do this thing again. All right. All right. Uh-huh. Thank you. Thank you.